up to the great ideal that the church holds out to us. But I remember coming to the conclusion one day that everybody at some point in his life has to answer the question, do I intend to live as a human being or do I intend to live as a beast? And the Catholic Church holds out a glorious and noble path of life in which you're not self-absorbed, in which the whole world doesn't revolve around you, but you are part of a nexus where you care about other people and you care enough about yourself to treat yourself with dignity. And I recall there's a, there's a quotation from Seneca, an ancient Roman, who said, what a contemptible thing is man if he fails to rise above the human condition. Even a pagan Roman understood that there's something about unaided human nature that is incomplete, that cannot live the virtuous life without extra help. So it was almost as if Seneca understood that if we're going to live a life that truly befits a human being, we need the assistance of divine grace. Now, the animal kingdom is composed of creatures who possess only instinct. They can't engage in moral reflection. They don't possess reason. So it stands to reason that we human beings should be held to a higher standard than the beasts, that we should observe moral principles, we should reflect on our behavior. Now, all this went through my mind as I was considering converting to the Catholic Church, and I was attracted to her moral teaching. A lot of people say, oh, the church is too tough in her moral teaching. She'll drive people away. To the contrary, people ultimately deep down want to be challenged. They want to be challenged by holiness. And I remember that that's what attracted me. And I remember learning that in ancient Greece, Socrates had said that to know the good is to do the good. That as soon as you know what the good thing to do is, well, you just automatically feel compelled to do it. But I knew that wasn't so. I knew of many times in my life when I had perfectly well known what the good thing was to do, and I absolutely had not done it. And I had perfectly well known what the evil thing to do was, and I had pursued that. So, so much for Socrates. But then you read St. Paul. And St. Paul has so much moral realism when he says that there are times when I know perfectly well what the good is, and I shun it. And I know perfectly well what the evil is, but yet I pursue that. And I remember when, once I finally did convert to the church, I remember my spiritual director telling me that the next time I was tempted to eat a cupcake, I should have a carrot instead. Now, what did he mean by that? Did he mean that cupcakes were evil? He meant that cupcakes are delicious. That's why it's an exercise of will to avoid them and that by avoiding something like a cupcake, which is morally neutral, I can train my will. I can, in effect, tell myself, I am in control. I'm not going to be swept away by passions. I'm not going to be swept away by irrationality. I can train myself, because by avoiding cupcakes and eating carrots, I train my will to be able to say no, so that when the moment of temptation comes, and I really am faced with a choice between good and evil, I will have a will that is trained to face it and come out victorious. Now, what a beautiful message this is, that as a human being you have such a dignity that there is a special kind of life that God wants you to live that is appropriate for you as a human being. And I was recently at DePaul University. They had an event called Catholic Week. I won't get into Catholic Week at a Catholic university. What about the other 51 weeks? That's another matter. But when I was at DePaul, a reporter for the student paper asked me, how would you sum up your talk? Give me one sentence. Well, I couldn't give her one sentence. Gave her two or three. But I said, here's what I would say to the students at DePaul. I would say that the Catholic Church is the most beautiful institution on earth. And if you want to live a good life, if you want to live a life that befits a human being, the Catholic Church has much to say to you. And that's a message I think a lot of young people who are totally adrift could stand to hear. Of course, I feel old any time I start talking about young people, but such is life. Now, let me conclude with this. The Catholic Church consistently emphasizes the dignity and value of human life and tells us that we are to live in constant awareness 
of our created nature in the image and likeness of God, that we are not to live as beasts, that we're not just to do whatever brings us pleasure, then we might as well be a cow. You're not a cow. You're a human being. Christ didn't die for cows. He died for you. And he died in, in part so you could live a good life so that we may be worthy to join with God in heaven. What, a, what an astonishing statement. It's particularly beautiful that the Eastern Fathers talked about deification, that in effect, as we live the life of the sacraments, we become like God. Now there is some real dignity. There is the idea that human beings aren't just random assemblages of cells, but they are worth something. They matter. And here's something you can finally tell to teenagers, that you don't have to live this crummy life that MTV is holding out for you. What in the world is there to compare between MTV and the Catholic Church, 2,000 years of heroism and holiness? And they think so little of young people, they're going to hold out the MTV alternative? Forget it. Ditch it. Don't live as beasts. Live as human beings. That's what the church has to tell us all. Now, there's another way that the church has emphasized the dignity and rights of the individual, and that is with the very idea of rights. And that's what we're going to pick up next time. Where does this idea that I have a right to life and a right not to be, not to be robbed or, or, or expropriated, that comes also from the Catholic Church. So join me next time for the Catholic Church Builder of Civilization. See you then.